Good morning. Good morning. My name is Kenny Lee. I'm the pastor here at Marvel United Methodist Church. I want to welcome everyone to this morning's worship service. For all of you joining us virtually, we are so excited for you to come and be a part of our worship service to share this time as we lift up the name of Jesus and open our lives to the work of God in each of our hearts. Uh, I must say that you are going to be disappointed if you're joining us virtually this morning because today, after church, is a potluck. And I made, I made um, Mississippi pot roast, and it's one of my favorites, and I think it'll become one of yours. And if you're joining us virtually, you can't share in that, in that community meal. So um, maybe get up and get out of your jammies and start moving this way. <laughs> We're so glad to be here to celebrate the graduation of Miss Gracie Fuller and Mr. Nathan Turner, to celebrate with their families this milestone in their life, and to have a community meal as we come together as a family of God. So I want to invite you to enter into a spirit of prayer with me. Holy God, we thank you for this midwinter morning. We thank you for the chance to just gather here and worship, to, to hear the words of Jesus, to experience experience anew the power of your Holy Spirit as you challenge us, as you empower us, and then send us out into the world to be salt and light. God, enliven your word as it's spoken with boldness today. Um, open the hearts of your people, Lord. Open the doors and windows of heaven and pour out on us a blessing that is too great for us to receive. May the name of Jesus be lifted up in all we say and do. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Virtually, the pastor and the announcements are not trying to be cruel to you because you're not getting the particular a potluck meal. I'm just telling you that we're at it. I know your mouth is watering, but there's no closure for that. The hymn of praise is number 451, Be Thou My Vision. Let us stand together and sing.
liturgy this morning is a call and response. May you will um, follow my lead. Wonderful is the God of Christ who gathers the poor of the earth. Glorious is our God who wipes away the tears of sorrow. Wonderful is the God of Christ who gives an inheritance to the meek. Glorious is our God who satisfies the hunger of the just. Wonderful is the God of Christ who gives mercy to the merciful. Glorious is our God who gives vision to the pure in heart. Wonderful is the God of Christ who adopts the peacemakers. Glorious is our God who lives on God's curse. Wonderful is the God of Christ who finds the lost. Glorious is our God who awakens the dead. Now I want you to repeat that last line with me. And I want you to do it with some enthusiasm. Glorious is our God who awakens the dead. Thank you very much. I want to thank you all 
for this lovely gift. And thank you for allowing me the time off to be, um, to be away from the congregation. I want you to embrace the people who are going to be our um, speakers. They are both excellent speakers. Scott Russell, who is from here, he's one of you. He's excited about the opportunity, and my good friend Ed C. is coming as well. So I know that you guys are going to love and support them, and I want to thank you for also financially supporting this trip to the tune of $1,500. So you paid my financial portion of the trip, and you gave me some money to spend while I'm there. I'm so grateful to all of you, and thank you very much. Thank you. time for our joys and concerns this morning. Some prayers of thanksgiving. Tori Jo Gist, daughter of Chase and Lindsay Gist, was born Wednesday. That's three babies in a row here. Seven pounds, two ounces. She's the granddaughter of Cotton and Annie Gist, and great granddaughter of Kenneth Gist. Becky Hall, Mary Hendricks, McDowell, Lou Mayo, Damon Clements and Perry R. Sullivan's surgery went well. My goodness. You know, folks get to cut on that. Nathan Turner has joined the Marine Corps. Hoorah. <laughs> Leaves for boot camp in May in San Diego. MCRD. I've been there. <laughs> Fun place. Any other joys? I've got one looking out at the crowd. We've got a pretty good crowd this morning. Thank you all for being here. Anyone else have a joy? Well, I have a, I have a joy I'll share with the community. Um, first of all, I will say that if you feed them, they will come. <laughs> <laughs> and, and secondly, uh, Penny and I attended the Bishop's installation service yesterday. What a joy to share that time. Um, heard her speak for the first time. Really amazing sermon. Um, a lot of folks from around the connection there at Pulaski Heights. The sanctuary was completely full. We had the opportunity to meet her in person for the first time, so that was a joy. And I think that you are going to be surprised and pleased with the leadership of this new person. She will lead as well. Cheer. Got to meet you yeah. <laughs> Any other jokes? Yes, me. My son is home and doing well. Good. And I also got my cast off, but it's still broke. <laughs> I have to keep this for four more weeks. I'm old and I didn't feel right. Just well, what the doctor said. <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Miss Barry? Got a new great grandbaby, nine pounds. list of prayer requests this morning, so bear with me. Uh, Chad Warren, Lanny Travis, Becky Hall, Dina Duffel, Judy Adams. 
Adamson, Ann McFarland, Jody Lambert, Bobby Dubach, Shelton Guest, Kenneth Guest, Michelle Furman, Barksdale Collins, Theta Coleman, Pearl Pope, Abby Perkins, Debbie Perkins, David Whisperer, Dylan Trott, Prudence Hefner, Taylor Rowland, Miranda Rocca, Cohen Gregory, Kaylin Rivera, Reed Williams, <coughs> Ian Miller, Chance Adams, uh, Berkeley Leonard, Magnolia Daugherty, Otto Latham, Mary Hendricks McDowell, <coughs> Mal Malina yeah. Ke Melanie Keys. Why do I mess that up on this? <laughs> Sue Lasker, Billy and Mickey Terrell, Sue Lighter, <coughs> Helen Harper, Wanda Brock, Sheila Brock Smith, Stephanie Powell, Stephen Jones, Linda K. Arnold, Warren Jackson Garner, Annie Head, Zach Miller, Mary Kay Bird, Johnny Turner, Johnny and Shirley Schwinn, Bill Brown, Lee Scarborough, Anita Cor Quarter, Dale Tanner, Melba Robinson, Albert and Pam Godfrey, Gene Richmond, <clears throat> Terry R. Sullivan, Kara Abel, Wayne Johnson Brown, Dale Webster, Winston Turner, Lewis Acock, Debbie Hayes, Brenda Woodyard, Russell Lee, Shirley Young, Wanda Snyder, Robbie Lassiter, Carolyn Sue Hill Campbell, Lynn Hosey, Mackie Burr, Mackie Burr uh, Jimmy Oliphant, Carolyn and Mary Wilkinson, Alan and Pam Fallschultz, Leah Catherine Anderson, Becky Mott, Robert <coughs> Dennis, Jay Hall, Amanda Strickland, Joyce Summerhill, Judy Be Bellamy and Debbie Gordon, Bill <coughs> Pilla, Drew Perkins, Janelle Piney, Brett Hankins, uh, Lindsay <coughs> Hudson, Tammy Duggar, Dorothy King, Jerry Thompson Raven, Hayden Johnson, Carol Martin, Dennis Nelson, David Treadway, Courtney Turner, Francis Shell, Joseph Cumberland, Vern King Williams, Bonnie and Curtis Petty, Pam Catlett, Garnet Howard, Agnes and Earl Whitson, Laurel Coker Catlett and Sherry Lynn Kimmer, Linda Moten, Katie Jacks, Charles and Barbara Robinson, Rebecca Ferguson, Hewitt Perkins, Mary Blush, Karen Reed, Jim Gateway, Bubba and Jamie Morris, Linda McDade, Alex Patrick, and Rachel Lee, <clears throat> Jerry Fan Fannin, the family of Warren Warren, and the family of Mike Bain. Are there any others? I think I named everybody in town. <laughs> and out of town. Bill, yes, ma'am. David Webb's going to have a heart ablation in February the 6th. Yes. He told me that that was going to happen. So well, you I need to keep him in our prayers. He told you. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any others? Let's remember the Wade family. That was the um, Warren lady's maiden name. That's, remember her and that. Brooke King? I see any hands for unspoken requests. I want to invite you to approach the throne of grace with me. Gracious God, we, your people, gathered here in this place, Lord. We 
We celebrate the sanctity of this moment, the silence of this sanctuary, as we open ourselves to you. Lord, there is one voice, but many hearts join to the prayers of these persons, people who we lift up week after week for their bodily health, for their situation. God, we pray that your spirit be poured out on each of those whose health is less than they would hope for it to be, that you would begin to facilitate not just healing, Lord, but wholeness, um, shalom, peace, and contentment, bodily health. Lord, we ask today that you would reach out to this family who has lost a loved one so tragically, to all those who mourn, Lord. We will read your word later, and it says that those who mourn will be comforted. God, we pray that you would allow each of us to be a part of that comfort, that as we know people are hurting, that we can come alongside of them, that we can sit with them and just be present. Lord, we ask today that you would give us a burden to pray for the lost, Lord, that you would help us to see the least and the last in this world where people live on the margins and fringes, barely keeping body and soul together. God, remind us that you have called us to be kingdom people, people who usher in the realm of God, that we as followers of Jesus are part of the way that God's kingdom comes here on this earth. Lord, we pray today for those who don't know Jesus Christ, that they might commit their lives and know the joy of a salvation that was purchased for us with the life of your Son. Father, we pray for those who have been displaced in this world, persons who, because of natural disaster or war or famine, are no, are no longer living in the place where they would long to be, God, we pray for um, wisdom and due diligence from global leaders as we seek to live at peace with one another. God, we pray for the boldness of your people who will stand up for justice, who will be persons of peace, Lord, in order that we can be more fully and more freely Jesus' followers. We, the children of God, pray with the confidence that we are given through your Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite the ushers to come forward this morning. try to have a mission moment every now and then, and this morning is certainly one of those. Um, a good friend of mine here in Phillips County, someone who was my friend before I came here, um, loves to support our Veritas trip for the kids. Our group is larger this year than it was in years past. We've got 11 kids and 10 youth right now, and he made a contribution of $2,500 toward, toward their trip, for which I'm truly grateful. I want to invite you to pray with me. Holy God, we give you thanks for this new day that you have given us. We thank you because you have given us glad and generous hearts, Lord. And as we open up our hearts, our resources, and our lives to your kingdom purposes, we pray that your will be done in all things. In Jesus' name, amen.
Today we pick up right where we left off last week in Matthew 5, and I'll be reading this morning verses 1 through 12. Hear these words. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you. When people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. God. May God add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, the understanding, and the living out of this word that we share. This passage of Scripture is so familiar to us, we saw it on felt boards and whiteboards and handouts when we were small children in Sunday school. And we look at that in today's world and we wonder, what does that have to do with where I live and who I am today? And, and too often we say, well, these are the ideals of the Christian life. And then we just kind of nudge them over to the side and continue to live in the ways that perhaps we've always lived. And that's not the spirit of this passage of Scripture. And in order for us to really fully understand, I want to lay a few things out for you so that you'll have a deeper understanding of the place and the person and the, and the, the situation in which this passage of Scripture comes to us. And so Jesus has just began his ministry. Last week we talked about that. John the Baptist has been arrested but not yet executed. And Jesus continues that ministry saying, preaching the good news, repent for the kingdom of God has come near. He's called four fishermen to be with him. And the text tells us that he's traveled widely all over um, this northern part of the kingdom of Israel into um, Gentile areas and that when Jesus gathers to teach, there are these mixed multitudes that come to him. People who are ethnic Jews, people who are a part of four um, separate sects of Judaism, sect of Judaism. Um, so you have people who are Essenes who are very ascetic. They're very disciplined in their observance of Torah. They believe that the priest in Jerusalem have it wrong and that they've messed everything up because their lives aren't right. They're not living consistent with the, the, the law. 
Then we have people who are the Pharisees. Pharisees are sort of, they're sort of the, the liberals of their day, okay? They believe in a more liberal interpretation of Scripture. They believe in angels. They believe that there's going to be a resurrection of the dead. But they're so strict in their observance that, that they don't leave any T uncrossed or any I undotted. And they're, and they're all about people being able to see the outward appearances of religion and not the inward effects. I want to say that again. They are all about seeing the outward appearances of religion but not the inward change of a life transformed. Then we have the people who conduct all of the temple worship and they are the religious elite of their day. They're the priests and Levites. Um, they are the ones who burn incense. They're the ones who fill the lamps. Um, they're the ones who offer the daily sacrifices and mediate the atonement between the people and God. But they believe that the reward that you receive in this life is it. What you have is what you get, and and you get and, and that you get what you deserve. So if you are if you die young or if you lose a child, if you're someone in your family is sick, it's a repercussion because you haven't lived faithfully before God. And then if you're wealthy and privileged and have a position of status, that's God's approval being poured out on your life. And that's not always, in fact, the case, is it? Especially in Western culture, right? Because we believe that, that if, you, if you, you get the right education, that, that you're successful, that you can become somebody, that you can become, you can move past your, your social standing that you were born in. And, and we're so wrapped up in, in the Western world in competition and fear that we can lose sight of the central teachings of Jesus Christ. And the last political party, the last group of people in, in Palestine in Jesus' day are a group called the Zealots. And these people, usually, they can be from any of the other three um, sects that I told you about. But they are they are so, they chafe so under the foot of the oppressor, under the soldier's boot and the spear and sword of Rome, that they are insurrectionists, okay? Um, we could say something like they are maybe... Um, there may maybe some of these fringe groups that, that are in a part of our Western understanding. They're part of America. We see these people all the time on TV. And so these folks are willing to slit the throat of a, um, of a Roman soldier just to get their point across. They just want, they want to be done with Rome. And so Jesus is in this, he's in this, time in, in the life of Israel when they're oppressed by the Roman Empire. They're, they're a vassal state. Um, they're ruled by kings who are in fact um, puppets of the Roman Empire and they're taxed heavily and there's, there's peace, but it's peace at the point of a sword. Peace at the point of a spear. Peace at the threat of imprisonment or crucifixion. This is the empire's peace, not the kingdom's peace. And so Jesus, as these mixed multitudes gather around him um, in this place in northern Israel called Chorazin, and um, there's this place called Mount Erasmus, which most scholars believe is actually the, pla the place that Jesus was. And, and so he climbed up this mountain over the top of this cave, and he sat down, and that's how... That's how um, rabbis actually taught in that day. And so I want all of y'all to stand up. Everybody stand up. Come on. At, at least those of you who are asleep will wake up. <laughs> and so this is the position that a rabbi and a disciple would have. So you can sit down now. I've got you all away. way. Um, so the, the teacher would sit and the rabbi and the, the disciples would stand. And the reason for that is nobody can go to sleep. Can't go to sleep. Stand. Well, I guess you can. But. It's important for us to remember from last week's text that these people who are there are people on the margins. 
There are people from Gentile lands. There are people from Jerusalem. There are people from Judea. There are people from all over the Decapolis, from Syria. So these people are coming from far and wide, and they're coming because they're healing. They're, they're hearing about this person who can heal with his touch, who can drive out demons, who can restore sight to the blind, who can literally make people who are being crippled, born, did other abled, now are fully able to participate in the life of the church. People who were unclean with leprosy are restored to a full state of health. This is Jesus. And he doesn't care who comes. He doesn't say, let me see, let me see if you have a phylactery strapped onto your upper arm or to your forehead. Let me see if you have the outward appearances of religion. Jesus has compassion. Let's say that word together. Compassion. And, and so as we approach this text, as we understand the political realm in which Jesus is trying to navigate, it gives us a better insight as to why sometimes Jesus said, you know, something happens and he said, don't say a word about this. And, and in fact, when Peter said, you're, you're Messiah, the son of the living God, Jesus says, don't say a word about this. And we wonder why that is. Why does Jesus not want people to know? And it's because of the physical location. They were right across from this citadel in, in, in Judea, across the Jordan, where it was the stronghold of the zealots. And if they find out that Jesus is Messiah, they're going to want Jesus to, to lead the charge. And that's not who Jesus is. That's not why he came. And so, so much of what Jesus' followers know about Messiah has to be unlearned. And they have to understand a different way, a better way. And I want to share a passage of scripture with you. When I start to read it, you're going to remember that this is, at least part of this, is the passage of scripture that Jesus read in Nazareth just before relocating to Capernaum. And this is Isaiah 61. And I'm going to read selected verses. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion. Y'all remember this part of it, right? This is like Jesus, this is his, his sermon text in Nazareth. And it goes on to say, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. And you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations, and in their riches you will boast. Instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion. Instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. And so you will inherit a double portion in your land, and everlasting joy will be yours. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. In my faithfulness, I will reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and, the, and their offspring among the peoples. And all who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. A people the Lord has blessed. And, and all of these, all of these um, beatitudes start with that, that word blessed. And, and we struggle to actually interpret the Greek in this word. The Greek word is makarios. And it means a whole lot more than like sometimes we... The Bible, certain translations will say happy or they'll say blessed. But it's much bigger than that. It's like this feeling of contentment. When you have found your place and you are satisfied with your place and, and you know that you are doing exactly what you were created for. That is, that, and, and so that English word blessed can't, it can't really do justice to that. And, and so as we look at this text, and we're too, often, we're too often guilty of pushing that to the side and say these are the ideals of, of the Christian life. In fact, they are an expectation. This is Jesus' is like framing his ministry for these people who are 
were gathered here to see this sermon, this mixed multitude. And Matthew does something very interesting for us. He, he shows us Jesus as the new Moses. And I'll tell you some of the ways that he does that. So, so Moses and Jesus both pass through a slaughter of the innocents. We talked about Jesus escaping Bethlehem a few weeks ago. You all remember that? And Moses is born during a time when all the male Hebrew children were pitched into the river Nile and drowned. And yet he's rescued by Pharaoh's sister. So they pass through this, this slaughter of the innocents. Um, they have both been a part of, and my mind is slipping, oh, Lord help me, Spirit give me that remembrance. They, they're both returning heroes. Okay, Jesus left and goes to Egypt and he comes back. Moses kills an Egyptian, flees for his life, spends 40 years of the worst job any man in that culture could ever have because believe it or not, most all the shepherds in this culture are women, almost to the exclusion of men. So for David, David was a shepherd because he was a little kid out there and his sisters were watching the flock and him too. Imagine that, some of you older siblings have to watch your children younger children. And so Jesus is a returning hero. Um, Jesus has passed through the waters of baptism and Moses passed through the waters of the Red Sea. And, and Moses goes up on Mount Sinai and receives the very word of God, the Decalogue, on tablets of stone that were written by the very finger of God. And Jesus stands on Mount Erasmus, the new Moses, sharing this new interpretation of the law the, the way that he, he sees the world, the way that God intends the world. And, and Jesus is not just, he's not just the person who receives the law, the word from God. Jesus is the word of God, amen? amen? He is the word of God. And so, right now, you okay, preacher, dinner's getting cold, you need to wrap it up. Okay, how do we live into this thing? There's three ways, three ways we should be living we should have a simple life. Simplicity should be the hallmark of a Christian. It means we don't have, we don't have more than we need. Um, Donovan is a good example of that. He, he doesn't have anything more than he needs. And if he hasn't worn it in a while, it goes out of the closet. If he hasn't used it in a while, he gives it away. He brought a TV into his sister's room the other day and then couldn't get it hooked up all the way. I had to go back and finish that for him. But simplicity in life. And there's nothing wrong with having things. But when we, we spend too much time keeping up with our things and cleaning our things and looking for our things, then we don't have the time that we need to devote to what it really means to be followers of Jesus. So we should have the ability to be simple. We should be compassionate people. Um, people whose lives are, are really compassionate toward everyone. Um, we should be people who don't just have sympathy for someone. We see something going on in their life and, and we feel sorry for them. Or even empathetic people, we see something going on in somebody's life and we feel bad for them and maybe we offer some advice. We should be compassionate people who are willing not only to see the hurt of another person, but to be willing to walk a mile in that person's shoes. To literally like take their place, to become one with them, to fully understand understand what it is. And we should be people of hope. How many of you look at the evening news like I do nearly every week because my wife loves to see the evening news and you struggle, you strain, you listen for an hour and a half so that you can get one 30 second clip of something good that somebody's done. A person who's a good example, maybe they're running a 501c3. Maybe they're a kid that's done something exemplary to show the mercy of God alive in their hearts. We should be people of hope in a place, in a world that is hopeless. It seems as though everything we hear on the TV is gloom and doom. Our politicians are crooks. Big business wants to pick our pocket. Taxes are going up. The cost of living is increased. But Jesus still loves you. And he still loves me. The Holy Spirit is still alive in our hearts. Maybe it's just a little 
little flicker. Maybe it's a, a flame. Maybe it's a gasoline fire. That's what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping to be a different person when I come back after 10 days of sabbatical and experiencing that place for myself. And I hope that I'm so on fire that, that my head's on fire and my tail's catching. I'm serious. John Wesley said that if you burn with the zeal of the Lord, people will come to see you burn. That's what we all should do. Alive and on fire for God. That's what I pray for each of you today. In the name of God and Christ and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Could you pray with me? Lord, this gospel that Jesus shows us today is full strength. It is not watered down. It's not diluted. But we believe that this is the way that he intends for us to live. And so, God, help us to commit ourselves to be a little more simple. To be humble people whose hearts are open and teachable. That hear your word and, and actually live it out, Lord. Help us to act out in this world to be people of justice and mercy. And Lord, and help us to show compassion to other people. To walk a mile in their shoes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The hymn of invitation is number 430. Oh, Master, let me walk with thee. Let us stand together. <coughs> Not only the compassionship 
the compassion and love that we share together, Lord, but the fellowship of the people of God. We pray your blessings on this community, on this church, on our leaders. In Christ's name, amen. amen. amen.